Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. We have a fantastic guest with us today. His father left him when he was just a young boy. So he had a void there, but God the Father became his father and taught him many things. You'll want to hear this, but that's not all. Later in life, Holy Spirit gave him a detailed tour of heaven. His name is John Finn. John Finn, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Jennifer. Glad to be here. So, John, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, what was your upbringing? Were you raised in a Christian home? Um, did you gradually become a Christian? How was your childhood? Well, childhood was actually very good. Um, you know, my dad was a business owner. Uh, my mom um, took us to ch church every, every Sunday. I'm the oldest of four kids. Uh, we were raised Episcopalian, so it was the same liturgy, you know, time in, time out. Um, just an upright family. Uh, until, um, you know, when you're a kid, you don't know the problems that your mom and dad have. But when we were, when I was 11 and a half, and we were 11, 9, 7, and 5, we four kids. When I was 11 and a half, dad left the family. And that, uh, you know, that changed our world completely. We went from upper middle income, maybe, or middle class, you know, the late 1960s, to my mom struggling to keep the house and the, you know, two and a half acres of land and all of that that goes with it. So it was a, an abrupt turn of events when I was about 11 and a half. So before your father left, were you guys a family of faith? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, but, you know, we, we, I mean, everything was good. It was the late 1960s. So, um, you know, because of both sets of grandparents, there was a lake cottage, there was a boat, there were camping trips, you know, everything like that. But we weren't really a, a people of faith or anything. Uh, my mom came to the Lord when my dad left. That's when she went that extra step because she later explained to me, she said, I, I had never experienced anything like, you know, the last thing I thought would be my husband leaving me for somebody. And, uh, and so she just turned to God. So she was always godly in that sense. My grandmother on her side was Mennonite by upbringing. And so there was always this element, but it, we were more church people than we were Christians yeah. or faith. I, 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 you know, I don't, uh, you know, beyond that, there wasn't anything. So you mentioned to me earlier that your father left. You said he divorced his children. Mm -hmm. Right. What happened was that my little sister, who was five at the time, uh, didn't understand what divorce was. You're, I mean, for us, you know, it's ancient. It seems so long ago when I say it was 1969, but that's the truth of the matter. In the circle that our family moved in, divorce was just not heard of. And it was 1960s. I mean, it wasn't that, that common. And so when my sister didn't understand, dad said, and he wasn't trying to be hurtful. He was just trying to lay it out there. He's a very analytical man. And, and he said, I'm divorcing your mother. I'm divorcing you kids. There won't be any birthdays, ball games, Christmas. I won't be around for holidays or anything like that. And so those words had an impact on me at 11 and a half. They were just like, you know, a knife to the heart uh, in terms of rejection. And, um, and as it turned out, um, he ended up marrying a lady with two children of her own, and that that became the focus of his attention. Um, even Jennifer, to the point that by the time I could drive, I had to meet my dad at the office, and he said, "Remember," he said, "this this meeting never took place uh, because uh, at that time, now she's fine with everything. I mean, decades have gone through, but at the time." He had promised to not have anything to do with us. And so the ongoing rejection between ages 12 to 16, 17 years old, where the only way I could see my dad were to sneak in the back door at his office and then him to start or end every meeting with this name, with saying, this never took place. You can't say anything to my wife. You can't say anything to, you know, anybody. And of course, I was going there because, uh, especially by the time I was getting ready for college and thinking about college, we had to work through who paid what and, and everything. So, you know, we had these little clandestine meetings, you know, in, in the back door of his office. And But it was an ongoing, you can imagine a, a teenager, that's an ongoing set of rejections. You know, all the ball games that he he's, he said, you know, I'll be there for the ball game. I'm going to sneak out and I'm going to watch you at the ball game. And then he never showed up. 
you know, and so there are dozens and dozens of those broken promises between ages 11 and a half and, you know, really through uh, the first year of college. Uh, and so you build up this, this rejection. Um, you know, my dad doesn't want me, you know, I, I'm, I'm fatherless. I've, I've got to help my mom raise my little brothers and my sister. Um, you know, there was just, there was a lot of rejection. There was a lot of self-image issues with me as a result because my dad had rejected me, at least in my mind. Uh, even though I knew that there were issues later, you know, between mom and dad, when you're a kid, you don't understand that they're adults just trying to get through life. You know what I mean? And uh, so it was, there was a lot of rejection, a uh, horrible self-image, uh, wondering why I was here. I, in those four years between the time he left and the time I turned my heart over to the Lord, I dropped out of every single thing I was involved in. I had been taking art lessons. I dropped out. I was a boy scout. I dropped out because I could see every other boy in the Boy Scouts had a dad. And I was the only kid without a dad and they would go camping. It was a father something. It was like, I, you know, I dropped out of that. Eventually through over those four years, I had, I had flying lessons because my dad had his own airplane. And, and so I thought I'd take flying lessons and became part of a group that, that did that. And I, I took lessons, I flew, but I never got my license. I dropped out. I took scuba lessons. You know, I'm not sure what I was going to do with my life, but I thought, you know, I, I like the idea of scuba diving. Never took my check dive. I dropped out. Just I, I flunked my first semester of algebra as a freshman. I just didn't care about life. I had a huge rejection, self-image, and just apathy towards life. When my dad said, I'm divorcing your mother, I'm divorcing you kids. It just had a huge, huge impact in my heart. Wow. I was searching for a father during the ensuing four years be before I came to the Lord, I, I was searching for a father. Mm. And, and let me say this, in, in hindsight, there were several men that the Father God brought into my life along the way that were godly examples. Um, the dads of some of my friends in school. And, and these, are, these are now men, but these are boys, you know, my age, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. I'm still good friends with to this day. And their dads were like, um, uh, like marks along a timeline. You know, th this man had a positive impact in this way. Another man had a positive impact this way. So I had father figures that I could see around me, but they were other, other friends' dad. They weren't my dad, but they provided a good example. So it was like the father did not leave himself without a witness, but at the time, it only made me feel my emptiness just that much more because they had a dad and it, they were godly dads. They were good, good dads. They were good people. Um, but I was still searching for a father for my own father. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you mentioned to me, it was a little harder too, because you were super tall. You were, are you six, six? I'm, I'm, I'm six, six. Yeah. Six, six. And because two of meters, that. Almost two meters. Yeah. For Europeans. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so you were that tall. So your mother saw you as what? What did she see you as? Well, when I when I was 18 and headed off to college, or maybe I was back home between semesters, I don't remember. But she apologized to me. She said, John, she said, I am so sorry. I realize now that I treated you like an adult when you were 12, 13, 14 years old. She said, but you were just so big. And, <laughs> and it, it, you know, and so it was like I was she went back to get her master's and MBA so that she could get a decent job to hold on to the house. So I did the babysitting for my little brothers and my sister. And I drove her because she couldn't drive at night, uh, cataract issues and stuff. And uh, so she couldn't drive at night. So I would drive her an hour to school and pick her up. And, you know, so I was like a right hand man, I, you know, almost two acres, two and a half acres to mow. So I, I mowed the grass and and uh, kind of corralled my little brothers and my sister, you know, when needed. And um, it, it was a, I had to grow up fast. And there was a big weight of responsibility from that. And that made turning to the father all the more. When, when my friend Janny in German class in uh, my freshman, sophomore, junior year, especially sophomore year of high school, when she, as a Roman Catholic, said, you know, you Episcopalians and we Roman Catholics use the same liturgy. She said, but I know the God behind the liturgy. That intrigued me. And, you know, I shared with you earlier with the, the way I got saved 
after watching she and her boyfriend and watching all the answered prayers, I watched seven answered prayers uh, between she and her boyfriend. And then I led my girlfriend to the Lord. And, and of course, she ended up marrying her boyfriend. I ended up marrying my girlfriend. And we double dated and they brought us along in the Lord. But the thing is, when I got saved, I didn't, I didn't pray a prayer of salvation the standard way. I just uh, very logically, I said, I said, Lord Jesus, you know, I believe that you're going to have the last word, the last say on my life on that last day. So it only makes sense to serve you now. And, and, and I said, come into my heart, change me, whatever you do, but I give you my life. <laughs> that, that was kind of like the, the prayer of salvation for me. But I got to tell you, Jennifer, the, the thing that my heart beat is that I never, I never really spent a lot of time on Jesus from that standpoint. Uh, I recognize that John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life but nobody comes to the Father but by me, or and nobody comes but by me. So I recognized, as, as a good friend of mine concisely said one day, Jesus is the way, but the Father is the destination. And somehow, intuitively, in my spirit, I knew that Jesus is the way, but the Father was my destination. And from that point on, I just started addressing the Father. And I could see in Scripture the Lord's prayers to the Father. Every prayer in the New Testament is to the Father. Every request, every every ask that we have, it is always to the Father throughout the New Testament, from the Lord's Prayer on. And so I got to know my Father. And to this day, he and I, I feel like we have a close relationship. And that's probably a factor when he told me I was called to be a seer when I was a teenager, and probably why, to some degree, that the Lord, uh, you know, started appearing to me since 1986 and still visited visits me you know from, from time to time to teach me things prophetic things there's a mutual love of the father and i'm not saying other people don't or anything like that i'm nothing special trust me i'm nothing special i'm not perfect ask my wife ask my kids ask my grandkids i'm not, not perfect but there is this love of the father that was intense from the very beginning and my i, I want every young man and every uh, young woman who maybe doesn't have a dad around to get to, to know that they can talk to the Father God very conversationally, and he will respond. He will uh, communicate back to you. And you told me even that God the Father taught you how to do certain things while you were a teenager. Well, because, you know, suddenly I was in charge of a 3,500 square foot house, two little brothers and a sister, uh, almost two or three acres of, of land, two and a half, I think is what we had and a little riding lawnmower and everything else. And so I remember one time in particular, the, the riding lawnmower was broken. And I said, Father, you got to, I said, how do I fix this? What's wrong with it? Because I knew money was tight. And Mom wasn't going to have a repair guy or, you know, whatever. And he just walked me through what the repair was. And that kind of thing has happened to me throughout. Um, there was a car we were driving and uh, I'll share this, give you another example, a car and, and when you turn the corner, uh, you could hear a grinding between the rear wheels. And I talked to somebody and they said, it sounds like the differential, which is a gear in between your rear wheels uh, on a rear wheel drive car. It, and it, it needs 90 weight oil. And they said, add 90 weight oil and the grinding of the gear should go away. Well, I crawled under there and Jennifer, you probably haven't crawled under a, a rear wheel drive vehicle with a differential, but there is a square hole. There's a square hole and that you un, and you stick something in there and unscrew it and then you can pour in the oil. Well, you know, I mean, what do I know? I don't know anything. I'm crawling under there and I see the square hole and I'm thinking, how in the world can you unscrew this plug? And I, I said, Father, what do I do? And d distinctly, go get your socket wrench. And I said, No, Father, you don't understand. It's not a socket that I have to put, you know, something over a nut. This is a hole. It's a square hole. He said, like, Go get your socket wrench. And so I crawled out from under there and I, I ignored him because I thought, okay, you know, when you're, when you're conversing with the father like that, you don't, you keep thinking in natural. It, it just seems so normal and so natural that you just go about your business. I couldn't find anything in my toolbox. And so I went to a neighbor's and right on top was a socket wrench. And the socket wrench has a square protrusion that you set the socket on. And immediately, as soon as I saw that socket wrench, I understood. 
And so I got my socket wrench, unscrewed it, added the oil, fixed the car that way. So lots, that's just one example of lots of little ways that the father would, would talk to me. And I learned how to hear his voice pretty good. It was like a trial and error. Uh, back in the day, you know, I'm 64 as we're recording this. Back in the day, you tune the radio, you know, and you'd hear, you get close to the signal and you go, and then the signal would come in strong and you'd go back the other way on the dial on your radio. And it, sometimes I felt like that. I felt like I was hitting and missing it. But it was like I wanted to get the right wavelength so that I could hear his voice and hear what he was communicating every time. And so gradually that, that became my focus and was until the Lord appeared to me on October 1st of 86 to teach me in much more detail about how the father communicates. Yeah. Amen. I'm excited to hear that. We're going to get to that really soon. But I just want to ask you a question where viewers may be uh, wondering in the back of their head, did your father eventually rightfully reconcile with you your siblings and your mother uh no not really um he keeps in touch with one of my little brothers who generally takes the initiative to call him once or twice a year um the rest of it no he you know he really hasn't wanted to have anything to do with us i'm actually closer to my uncle his brother to my uncle uh, than I am. Well, I just haven't talked to my dad in ages. Uh, so there was one time when our children were younger, um, maybe the late 90s, late 1990s, maybe 25, 30 years ago, that I kind of forced, uh, I said, we're going to be in your area. Would you like to at least meet your grandchildren? And uh, he was kind enough to, to come over and meet my kids. You know, they were younger, like I said. And, uh, and that we stayed for about 40 minutes. And so we talked and that was the last time I've, I've seen him and pray for him and stuff like that. And he could pick up the phone today and we'd just pick up where we left off. There's no, you know, one of the, one of the proofs of divine healing inside is that the memory remains, but there's no pain associated with it. And so, and so that's, um, you know, that, it took me 10 years to work through forgiveness. We didn't get into this. And maybe this is a bit of a rabbit trail. But when Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty five, 25, as you stand praying, forgive, that made forgiveness a decision, not an emotion. And I understood that very early on. So at age 16, I recognized I had to make the decision to forgive. And trust me, you know, as a kid, I was not, I was not without blame. I mean, there were things I said and things I did, anger, out of anger, out of rejection, out of hurt, and everything else uh, that I said, you know, in out loud and in print and whatever to my dad, just out of anger, just because he just walked out. But I made the decision at six, age 16 uh, then to forgive. That is a decision. The emotions took 10 years to work through. And people, unfortunately, aren't taught the Jewish concept of forgiveness, which is what I'm sharing now, and I'm not going into detail, but it is the that forgiveness is a decision and you work through the, the emotions. Because in the law of the trespass, you had the vertical, which was the guilt of sin, but then you also had the horizontal, which was the injury. And so a person can, can deal with forgiveness vertically between them and God and say, I forgive that person. But horizontally, you have to work through the injury that they caused. Whether they want to reconcile or not, you still have to work through it. And so what happened with me is over the course of 10 years, marriage, kids, I, I started, you know, the father would bring, I, it, some people might have thought it was the devil, but I took it as the father God would bring things up to remembrance. And as soon as I would get them and I'd rehearse them a little bit in my mind, I'd get stirred up and angry again. And I said, no, 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 no. I bring it back to my decision at age 16. I forgive. And and then that that memory would be would be just gone. And maybe a day or two later, or a week or a month later, there would be another memory. So over the course of 10 years, I dealt with everything that I had in my memory bank about all the broken promises, all the anger, etc. And so uh, when I was 26 years old, it was uh, around Christmas when I was 26. The final thing I had to work through was I, I did not have my teenage years with a dad around. That was the big thing. And somehow within myself, I just said, you know what, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. I turned out okay. And it was gone. And so now I have the, the memory of all those things, but there's no pain associated at all. And that's why I say my dad could pick up the phone right now. And we just pick up where we left off because there's absolutely no pain associated with any of it. 
Praise God. And that shows how God can change a whole situation. What seems impossible becomes possible. So I want to go into yeah. where you told me how. Yeah, I was just going to say, gonna say you have to be sure. To, I just going to say you have to be sure to that when you work through and stir that up, you bring it back to your original decision to forgive. Okay, final word. On that. <laughs> <laughs> and so okay. um, <laughs> you're good. So, so I wanted, um, I wanted to go to where you mentioned that because this starts you off on your spiritual journey of you seeing in the natural and the supernatural. God the Father or Holy Spirit told you that you would become a seer. Tell us about that. How old were you during that time, and what did you start to see? What was the first thing you began to well, see? Well, uh, yeah, I was like sixteen years old, seventeen years old. Um, I didn't know what it was. Um, I had to look it up. Uh, I think it's in First Samuel chapter nine, maybe. It says that the seer is an old word for prophet, um, and they were called seers because they could see in the spirit realm. But my journey was not like, oh boy, I'm called to be a seer, because I, I was raised Episcopalian, so I had zero knowledge of of the Bible, really. You know, I mean, we listened to our priest's twenty minute homily, you know, and uh, you know his little message with a little bit of humor, and that was it. And so when I started reading my Bible, I started, I, I just assumed when I read the book of Acts that that was normal Christianity. As the book of Acts presented itself over the course of 30 years of history, of church history from Pentecost on, or uh, the ascension of Jesus on, um, I just thought that was normal. So uh, people saw Jesus, Jesus appeared to Paul, um, you know, he appeared, you know, at, to in Damascus, in Corinth, when he was in Jerusalem, uh, Cornelius saw an angel. Uh, Peter raised a girl from the a woman from the dead. You know all these different things. I just thought it was normal Christianity to see the Lord, see angels, cast out demons, heal the sick. Uh, that to me was normal. And so when I and then I started reading the Bible, I saw Adam and Eve walking and talking with the Lord, and I realized they had to be able to see the garden around them. Plus they saw the Lord, so their eyes were open to both realms at the same time. And then I read in 2 Kings 6 when Elisha is surrounded by the enemy army and his servant is afraid. And he says, Lord, open up his eyes so he can see what I see. And the Lord did so. And so the servant saw not only the surrounding army, but he saw an army of angelic chariots and, and angelic army surrounding them. So they saw both in the natural and the spiritual at the same time. So that became, in my mind, that was just normal Christianity. So when I was in high school, there are just little things that I was a little mini, mini visions type of things where I would just see things here and there. And just uh, maybe if I pray for somebody, I'd get a little picture, like a word of knowledge presented in picture form or something, which is normal. That's not a, a sign of being a seer. That's just a normal function of the gifts of the spirit. Even though I had that desire, um, I got kind of a slap in the face uh, just by listening. In, in 1980, I heard a teacher Bible teachers say if he never saw the Lord, if he's never saw an angel, if he never went to heaven, et cetera, that, that he would be just fine with that, that he, he would know the Lord by his word. And I, it was like a rebuke, even though it wasn't intended, he was just speaking it out. But it was like, oh my, I better double check myself. I've had this desire since I was a teenager. And now I'm at that point, I'm, uh, when am I, 58, 68, 78? So I'm, I'm 22 years old. And these last six years, I've been trusting and believing that this is normal Christianity. But, you know, should I be willing to just live the rest of my life just knowing the Lord? But if I don't see anything supernatural, then that'll be okay. And I wrestled until I finally came to a point that said, okay, if I never, if the book of Acts is not normal Christianity, if all I have is my personal faith, then, then that's fine. And that, I'll tell you what, Jennifer, that was, that took a long time to wrestle with within me till I, till I could actually truthfully tell the father, uh, you know, if I never see the Lord or angels or anything like that, then I'll be fine with that. And it took, it took a couple of three months of really heart search and adjustment to come to that. And of course, then out of the blue, April 1st, 1986 was the first, or not April 1st, excuse me, April of 1986 is the first time I saw the Lord. And, uh, and that was the start of a, a journey that lasts to this, to this day. You know. Okay, we're going to get to that. But I want to get to something you mentioned earlier. You told about seeing in the natural and the supernatural you mentioned to me about the five senses we know we have five right. senses but you mentioned something even deeper that never crossed my mind what did you tell me well when 
the Lord appeared to me October 1st of 1986. And he said, I want to teach you how, uh, how the father communicates. One of the first things he went to was the example of Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, where a, a story is presented where a rich man who had a beggar named Lazarus laid at his gate. The beggar Lazarus, it says, the dogs came to lick his sores. The beggar just hoped to get some crumbs from, uh, from the rich man's table. And in the course of time, that, that text says, both men died and went to their respective places. The rich man went to hell. He obviously was not following the law of Moses because he ignored the beggar, which is contrary to, to the law of Moses. And, and the beggar went to Abraham's bosom or captivity or paradise. It goes by several names or went by several names in, in Judaism at that time. And they both, and what the Lord brought out in this visitation is both men's bodies were buried on the earth, but they recognized one another. They saw one another. They talked to one another. They heard each other. Uh, the man wanted water uh, because of the heat. So sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing, all the five physical senses were intact, even though they were just spirit and soul in their respective places. And what the Lord told me is this. He said, the, the root of your physical senses is actually in your spirit, man. And that suddenly just opened up revelation that why, you know, how do people hear angels sing? How do you smell the aroma of the Lord? Or if you've been around death, there's a spiritual uh, stink to the smell of death. And it's with your spirit man senses so that I understood that with my physical senses, I interact with the physical world, but with my spirit man's senses, I interact with the spiritual world. And it is learning how in my soul, in my mind to pay attention to both the physical senses on one hand and my spirit man senses on the other. And for me to be aware of that. And, um, uh, and I don't know if you want me to go on or not about what, when I asked the Lord for some chapter and verses, what he gave me, but I'll let you direct that. <laughs> well, I mean, well, but this even, this even explains how, when a person dies, they can still, you know, express that I saw this, I felt this, I smelt this, like what you said, I, you know, everything was yes. still there. It wasn't, or it was even heightened, right? Right. You, we, you know. Yeah, Paul says in Romans 8, oh, you know, 22 through 24, he says, we're waiting for the redemption of the bodies. We're waiting to have the, a, a, a body that is made of heavenly material. Uh, as he said in 1 Corinthians 15, that this corruption must put on incorruption. Jesus has a glorified body. He's got a body made out of heavenly material from a higher plane of existence. But when a person dies right now, it's their spirit and soul, which are united, can't be, can't be separated but it's the spirit and soul that go to heaven and, um, you know, and, and awaiting the, the redemption, the full redemption of the body. Like Jesus at his, at his resurrection, his body was transformed into the glorified body that uh, he has now. So uh, if a person grows, you know, Hebrews 5, um, Hebrews 5 uh, 14, I believe, says that strong meat is for those who by reason of use have trained their senses to discern between good and evil. And what that means in part is that we have to train ourselves. And Jennifer, we do this. The Lord is communicating to us oftentimes, even before we know him, these spiritual senses. The world uses things like, I had a hunch. I have a premonition. I don't feel good about this. Or, yeah, this makes me feel good. I think I'm going to go in that direction. It, what that is, is the Father God in his great goodness still communicating down in a person's spirit man. I mean, how else would we all come to the Lord if we didn't hear, if we weren't responding to the invitation of the Father to come and believe on Jesus? And so it's, it's sometimes people have to get in their minds to say, yeah, God talks to the unsaved, because how else would they get saved if they're not drawn? Jesus said the Father draws them to himself in John chapter 6. Um, but anyway, so it's, it, it is that, you know, when you're at the grocery store and you see a maybe a little old lady, and there's like a little dark cloud, rain cloud over her. And you say, man, that, that lady is depressed. Well, your mind was drawn to her physical stature or the look on her face or whatever. But in your spirit, you felt this darkness, this depression. And so that's what we're talking about. With your spirit, man, you can sense spiritually where she is. And your mind, you have to train yourself in your mind to pick up on, to be sensitive to these things and actually respond to them. Uh, and so that's a, that's a lifestyle. And, and it, 
you know, for what we do in the in house church and uh, and everything, that is that sensitivity to one another is just a very normal. You, you learn that the gifts of the spirit were not designed to be in the four walls of a church; they were designed to be out there in real life. And so, if you start living like that, that sensitivity, you start asking the Father, "Do you have anything for this waiter or waitress? Do you have anything for this?" person I'm running across in the grocery store, you start thinking in those terms uh, because your mind is always shifting between your natural senses and your spirit man senses. That's good. That's really good, John. <laughs> food, spiritual food. So John, you had this huge detailed tour of heaven. Could you tell us about this tour of heaven and what you saw and all the beautiful yeah. galore? <laughs> well, the, uh, I don't know if we've got the time, but the, t the, the actual tour happened in 1989. 86 was the first time the Lord appeared to me in a teaching visitation. But in 1989, he had told me, he said, I want to, I'm going to give you a tour of heaven. And real quickly, I was, I was a pastor of a church, a small country church, and I was just in the sanctuary praying. I was kneeling down, had my hands up, and suddenly my eyes were open to that realm um, where my eyes were wide open in the natural. So I saw the church and everything else, but my eyes were also open to the spirit realm. And I saw my angel's arm, his forearm from his elbow down in the air. And he said, and he said, uh, take hold of my hand. And I watched my spirit man's hand arm come up out of my physical and grab his hand. And when I did, it was just like being pulled out of my body, just, whoosh. and we were just flying through space at what seemed was space at a tremendous speed. Um, in fact, when I turned around to try to find the planet Earth, I couldn't even find, I couldn't identify our solar system or anything. Um, and I was, I was surprised that the, that you never get any closer to the stars than what you, you know, it's on Earth, you think, okay, the stars are out there, but if I could fly through space, I'd get closer to them. Well, the distances are so vast, uh, I guess, you know, flying through space, it's like they're just as far away. And we started to deaccelerate. When I couldn't find the earth, it started to deaccelerate. So I turned around and there just suspended was this huge walled city. Uh, the walls like 20 stories high, pure white, pure white light. Um, and I realized that as I looked into that white light of the walls, I could, if I focused, I looked in there to the walls and then I could see lots of different colors. And the, uh, the walls had, um, jewels in them and not jewels like the size that you would wear on a, on a wedding ring or or an anniversary ring or something like that these were like four and five feet long embedded in the in the stones of this of the city especially the lower parts of it it was just amazing and beautiful all the different colors but if you were just to glance at it you'd say wow that is pure white pure glory of god but if you looked into the light then you could see all the colors so we came up over the wall of the city and I remember looking at the architecture and it was from all ages and from all over the world. Uh, flat roofs, uh, pitched roofs, the little onion dome things that Eastern European churches have on top of them. Um, not that there were churches, but there were just like towers with these. You know, there was just architecture from all over the world. Broad boulevards, uh, narrow streets. I didn't see any vehicles, just people walking around. There were homes of all kinds, uh, like I explained, a uh, Philadelphia row house in New York, row house where y'all had the same sidewalk going up um, and just people walking around. And then where we landed, the angel and I uh, landed in a grassy area and there was a small stone wall to my right that was like the, oh, where there were homes and everything. And off to my left, it was just grass and trees and forest and and everything and and the river of life or a tributary or part of it i don't know that was running to my left probably 50 feet across that'd be you know close to 15 or 20 meters across and uh grass growing right down to the water's edge and i got uh, it, the water was making its own waves it was so happy so alive that it was making its own waves and when i looked over there i giggled like a schoolgirl. i mean i literally I told you this before earlier, I, I looked at these waves and I just started going, <laughs> and I'd have to look away to keep from laughing. And it was just, I just felt like, wow, you know, it just made me happy. And running through, there was a rustle in the grass on the other side. And I thought, okay, that's curious. It was like the top of a back of an animal because the grass is 18 inches, maybe 20 inches tall, maybe two feet, I don't know. 
but I could see an animal coming. And then just at the water's edge, I saw who it was. It was our golden retriever, Abby, that had been hit by the school bus. And she jumped with one leap over that, over that river and came running over and sat at my feet, tongue hanging out, not because she was tired, but just because that's golden retriever look, you know, looking up into my eyes. And I suddenly heard her say, where's Barb and the boys? Or heard her think, where's Barb and the boys? My wife, Barb and the boys. My head snapped around my angel. And I was like, my dog just talked to me. <laughs> and, and he said, when you're in heaven, you can take part in the Father's unlimited knowledge as you have need because it's governed by love. And I went, whoa. And I just looked back at her and I, and I just, in my mind, I just, I said, uh, I, and I know it was by the Holy Spirit, but by my spirit, you know, I, I just said, uh, it's just me. Uh, and it's just, they're not here right now. And she said, okay. And on her back was my pet monkey, Tilly. Now, when I was 14 years old and a very hurting teenager, back in that day, you could buy monkeys at the pet store in the mall. And I, this little squirrel monkey, it's about a foot tall. And it's a, if you look up squirrel monkey online, you'll see what they look like. They're natives of South America. And I bought one. I named her Tilly. I had her for, for about a year. She died. It turned out there was a reason she was small for her species. Um, she had something congenital in there. But during that year, that brought great healing to nurture something, to care for something, and to have the affection back of this little monkey. And, and when I was there in heaven, she crawled up on my shoulders on the back and looked over the top of my head like this, like she used to do when I was 14 years old. Um, and, you know, the way what happened, I don't think that all pets necessarily automatically go to heaven. But when Abby got hit by the school bus, in, and I remember it distinctly because we made a little headstone for her. Abby's January the dog, 3rd, right? 1989. Abby is the dog. January 3rd, 1989. And, and our boys were young. And we, it was very traumatic for my wife and my kids, for me, that she would get hit and killed by the school bus so abruptly taken from us. And such, you know, a dog and young children and so emotionally part of the family. And here she was several months later in 1989. She's in heaven. We had prayed at her funeral, quote unquote, uh, that the father would take her to heaven. And the rationale was the same rationale I'd used years earlier when Tilly died when I was 15, 14, 15 years old, right at 15. Um, you know, I, I came back later, a year and a half later after I was born again. And I said, Father, Elijah was taken away by chariots pulled by horses. Jesus is coming back on a horse. Revelation 19 says that the saints are coming back riding white horses. So if there are horses in heaven, then why not a monkey? And that's what I said as a teenager. I said, I don't, the word cloning was not in the vocabulary back then. And, you know, 19, you're talking 1976 at that point, 1975, 1976. And so I, uh, I just said, if you make a duplicate, if it's really her, I don't know. I just, I, I would like Tilly in heaven. So there it was in 1989. I saw that the father in, in retrospect, even though I was not saved when Tilly died, that he was kind enough. And I don't know how he did that. I still don't know. But all I know is my Tilly was there in heaven. And, uh, and then she climbed back on Abby's back, uh, just like a horse rider. And holding on to her fur and they turned around they went back they jumped once over the over the river and headed off to the right and my angel said the children in school really enjoy them and so to cut time wise on you know where we are the, the angel and i jumped with one jump over the river i remember thinking jesus when he walked on the water in the gospels matthew 14 mark 6 john 6 I, I, I thought, you know, Jesus, this probably wasn't the first time Jesus walked on water because I knew somehow intuitively that the angel and I could have walked across the water. We could have swum in the water. We could have waded through the water, but we, but for whatever reason, we just took a step and just kind of jumped over it uh, that tremendous distance, 50, 60 feet. On the left side, there's, there's this low, uh, what looked like a brick building. And there was a door on the end of it and kids had come out of it. And this was some sort of schooling. And my mind is kind of going like bonkers because I'm thinking school, really. Um, but I started thinking, you know, Sir Isaac Newton was a Christian. He invented so many parts of, uh, you know, of mathematics. Can you imagine being taught by Isaac Newton? You know, can you imagine talking to Jonah 
about his experience in the whale. Can you, you know, all these different stuff start running through my mind. I'm thinking, man, I want to go to school again. Um, but all these kids were playing, but what they were playing with Jennifer were, there, there was the, the usual, you know, dogs and cats and turtles and lizards and, and pets that, that people have, that kids have, uh, that the father's good enough to have in heaven. Evidently some kids have prayed, you know, can my little fish be in heaven or whatever. But there were African animals. There was a giraffe on the other side of this wall just kind of watching what was happening and bending down its neck and kids were rub, rubbing it behind the ears. And, and there were uh, big cats. A kid was wrestling with like a black panther and another kid with a lion. And they were just wrestling. And there was communication going on between the animals and the, and the kids. You know, I mean, it was all great fun. And I was just amazed. But as we were walking there, uh, there were three people, three kids that stood out. One was, two were, uh, two little girls about ages six and eight, well, eight and 10, six and eight, something like that. And as we're standing there, I'm just watching this and I ask about the one girl in particular, her hair was honey, golden, beautiful, the thick, rich hair. I mean, just, you know, you've got a crowd of people and there's that young girl, eight, 10 years old with just beautiful hair. And so I asked the angel and he said this, he said, these two girls died in a cancer treatment center in Houston, Texas. And uh, at that time, then by the spirit, those girls recognized that I was asking questions. And, uh, and so the angel continued as talking. He said, the girl with the hair, he said, on earth, she had beautiful hair as well. But uh, when she received treatment, all her hair fell out. And she told people it didn't matter, but your father knew that she was just being brave and putting on a, uh, on, a, on a good show for everyone to be strong. So he made sure when she came to heaven that she had, that what well, else makes me cry, she had the most beautiful hair, uh, what she had on earth and more so. Um, and that, that was so special that the father knew, here was a little girl just being brave, she lost all her hair through chemo and she said, it, it doesn't matter. And, and people look at it and say, what well, she was lying. It's like, you know, she's a little girl just trying to be brave. You know, there was no deceit in her, in her heart. Um, and so when she got to heaven, the father, the angel said, your father uh, made sure that she had beautiful hair. The other girl, by that time, the other girl, they came up, up together and the little girl said, I wasn't a Christian uh, when I got sick and went to the hospital and met her friend there. And she said, I wasn't a Christian. She said, but but people would come by, volunteers would come by and they'd read me stories. And some of those were Bible stories. And just one day, just without any saying anything or anything, I just kind of gave my heart to the Lord. I just believed in Jesus. And, and so when look? I died, I came here. How old did she? Oh, six or, she was like six or eight years old. Okay, okay. Six or eight, okay. maybe seven. Yeah. Now they're all grown up. Kids grow up in heaven. Babies grow up. Um, you know, they, so... Anyway, um, there was a there was another a boy that stood out. He was uh, obviously from India. Um, he, you know, was was about twelve years old, thin, thinner, um, uh, good looking kid, but clearly from India. The black kind of <laughs> kind of hair uh, that's kind of long and and just like a twelve year old kid playing. You know, doesn't really care about styles or anything. Just he's just cool. You know, and. Um, and he told me, he said he came from a very poor family. And he said, I had heard of Jesus, but just as one of the gods in my country. And he said, I just thought he was a god like any of the other gods. And he said, my family was very poor. And because I was oldest, uh, I, they didn't have enough food for me and enough money to take care of me. So I uh, moved out into the streets and I survived as best I could. He said, I stole from people. Uh, I stole food. He said, I ate out of the garbage. I gave, ate out of uh, the trash cans. And he said, it was a miserable existence. He said, I, I sniffed glue and paint and anything I could find to dull the hunger pains in my stomach and, and, he, and the difficulty in my life. And he said, one day uh, I was weak. And he said, I was sitting there, but one day I looked out between buildings and there was a field out there that I could see and it was in the sunlight and there were flowers and grass and, and butterflies and birds. And I just said in my heart, surely there is one God who is the creator who made all that beautiful thing. That's the one I want to know. That's the God I want to know. 
And he said, he said, I died uh, a couple months later. And I learned that his name is Jesus. The creator's name is Jesus. And that's who I'd given my heart to and, and believed in at that moment. But so, you know, I, I just, I was, I was just amazed at the goodness of our Lord, of our father, that it just is the turn of the heart. You know, we, we, we want to religious, we want to make it so religious. We don't realize that there's a kid in complete ignorance and all he knows is the creator. And, and that's what Romans chapter one says, that the, the things of Godhead can be seen from creation. And if people don't want to acknowledge him as creator, then he'll turn them over to another mind. And, and that's their doing because they reject him. But the very first level of knowing God is as creator. And that's all that boy had. Um, from there, uh, we went to a place that um, it's, it's hard to describe on earth the size uh, of it. But there were angels who were about my size. Again, I'm 6'6". Six, six. And they were all standing like this, Jennifer. They were all standing like this with their, you know, you can't see you know, my lower section here, but this, their hands like this over their midsection. All right. And in between their hands, hovering in between their hands was, were spheres of, was a sphere of light. And these angels were lined up like shoulder to shoulder, just a foot, maybe, or two feet apart, you know, like you might do in gym class, you know, put your arm out and be that distance. And, and every single, and they had a solemn look on their face or looking straight ahead, like soldiers looking straight ahead. There was a solemnness to it, a seriousness to it, a, a, a holiness, a respect in their faces, and they wouldn't be distracted. And it wasn't like formal, like military-like. It was just on earth. That's the best thing I can compare it to. So there was a seriousness. It wasn't, it wasn't military-like, uh, but that's the best thing I can compare it to, the seriousness of a soldier on duty. But it wasn't military-like at all. It was just very solemn. And I, I, I looked at the spheres of light, and on the outside, it was like fuzzy fog. And I, I was thinking, Father, I'd love to know what it is that's on the inside of those little spheres of light. And as soon as I put that request, that silent request to the Father, uh, suddenly my eyes were open and I could see down inside the, the one closest to me. And it was a baby, like a baby in the womb. And my eyes, I'm sure about bugged out. And I looked at the next one, the next one, and I and the, I saw every single one of them. I looked at my angel. And I said, "What? What is this?" Because they, these angels were like I couldn't see. You know, there were so many just standing in in row, just boom, boom, boom. The size of the the area where they were, it was just millions of them. Had to be, had to be. Um, and I looked at my angel, and and he said, "This is where all the miscarried and aborted babies go." And, it, and, and they will fulfill, they will grow up and in time, they will fulfill their destinies. And I just went, I just went, oh my, you know, and I knew from scripture, like in Exodus chapter 20, I think it is, or, or 22, um, there's different scriptures in there. Like, like the law is that if a pregnant, if a pregnant woman is standing there and two men get in a fight and she becomes involved and she loses the baby, suffers a miscarriage. God says the, the man who was attacking her has to pay a fine or has to give life for life. So there was a recognition there in the book of Exodus that a, that a baby in the womb is life. We know scientifically that the heartbeat starts at, at 18 days in the womb. and But none of that meant anything to me then. I didn't know any of the stats or anything. Uh, or, or scripture really from that standpoint, it was just that this is where all the miscarried and aborted babies go. And in the ages to come, they will fulfill their destinies. So from there, that was an amazing thing. So from there, the ne next thing he took me to was what I would describe as a nursery. I did not see the transition between, between those fetuses, those babies, those little children in the womb to becoming a baby. I, I didn't see that transition. But what I saw was this large grassy area where there were people and angels uh, playing with and taking care of babies and toddlers, especially. And then to, as we walked by, there's this area where there's a, a wall that goes up about 10 feet. And then it's got a floor that goes out about 10 feet. So it's kind of L-shaped and it goes on for, I don't know how far, long, long distance. And in that area, where it had a wall and a floor, there were play pens and bassinets and things like that. And there were angels and people 
and they were holding babies that were wrapped in blankets, uh, angels and people. And I asked about that mix of angels and people. And my angel said, he said, well, there are people on earth who feel called and have that grace to take care of babies and little children. And that's their life, their, their ministry, their grace to do that. So when they get to heaven, if they choose, they can take part in that. He said, and, and he said, if you can receive this, for the most part, children are raised by their family members, if that's, pos if that's possible. And he said, but if not, then angels help out. And so it, it, later, I'm going to fast forward real quickly, and then I'll come back to this. Sure. Later, we, were, we walked by two little children who were sitting with their backs against a tree, a little girl and a little boy. The boy was a baby crawling around under a year old. And the little girl was four or five. And there were 14, I counted 14 adults around. And it looked like a family reunion type of thing. And I knew by the spirit that this was this girl's grandparents, aunts, uncles, you know, things like that, generations that had not known her or that she had not known. And I asked the, I asked the angel, I said, where are her parents? I said, I'm recognizing all these not that I knew the people I'm recognizing these are aunts and uncles and grandparents and stuff like that. So, but I don't see anyone, you know, who's there. I don't see her parent, their parents. And he said, these children died in a car accident, but their parents are still on the earth. And he's, and he reiterated when, when possible children are raised by relatives, by the relatives. And I said, I need chapter and verse on that. And he said, you've read Ephesians 3 14 that says for this cause, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And he looked at me and said, there's just one family in heaven and earth, just one family. So it's like I under, suddenly I understood why children are raised by relatives in heaven until they grow up. And everyone who grows up to about age 35 to maturity, uh, little children do. But anyway, going back to this nursery. So what happened, fast forward a little bit, is there was a rustle out in the grass. And if you've ever, somebody's ridden on an escalator or run up a ramp or run up stairways, imagine that there is beneath the grass some sort of an escalator or ramp or stairway. And what happened is first there's this rustle in the grass. And then I saw the top of somebody's head coming up like through the grass. And as, as it continued to move from my right to left, you know, the rest of her face became visible. And it was a woman, um, dishwater blonde hair. Uh, I don't have any idea what, what nationality uh, she was, but she was running, like running up a ramp, and you know, from beneath, which was very strange, from beneath, but she was running and she had her arms out like this. And everyone in that area stopped and was just looking at her and she was running. And I thought, and I went ahead in my in my eyes, it's like, okay, she's running to something. So I like flashed over to the direction she was running. And there was an angel standing there and he had his back to us. He was facing the wall, the back wall of the nursery. And he had this baby you could see in his arm from my angle, could just barely see this baby, the tiny, tiny baby in his arms wrapped in a blanket. But he was the only one who was not looking at her. Everybody else in there was just looking at her and watching what was happening. And he was like purposely away from her. And this is, this gets me, I don't tell this very often, but it's very special. I felt like such an interloper. I felt like I was violating something sacred to watch this. She, um, she ran to that baby. And just at the last second, that angel tur turned around and went like this and gave her, gave her her baby. And the angel said she died shortly after childbirth. And her heart is, is for this bait for her baby. Mm. Both the baby and the mother died, you know, obviously childbirth. And, uh, and there was just like a silence there. And I just, I just, you know, I just had to move on. Just like, keep walking, just keep walking, you know, and let that, that reunion. She took that baby and she spun around, Jennifer. Oh. She spun around in such joy. Her hair was, you know, out behind her. Uh, just spinning around and just just kissing mm. that that little baby and it's like okay I, I've got to move on you know because I, I just like I said when I was there I just felt like I was an interloper I felt like yeah. you know how could I it was such a sacred such a private moment between mother and, and child and I don't know whether it was a boy or a girl but yeah. 
um, just to be told she, the baby died in childbirth and she died shortly thereafter. Um, so that was, that was amazing. That was amazing. So John, let's go back to a little bit when you said that you saw houses in heaven when you first entered and you said there were different houses. There were row houses and you even told me there were tree houses. Now we know the Bible says that uh, in my father's house are many mansions, but you know the interpretation of what that really means. And can you share with us what you saw and paralleling it with scripture? Sure, sure. In John 14, 2, Jesus uh, is actually reciting part of the betrothal ceremony that a young man would state to uh, his fiance. Uh, when he would go to the to the girl's father's house to ask permission to marry, and he would, if she accepted, he would bring he would put forth a cup of wine, and if she accepted his proposal, she would take that cup of wine and drink it, and then he would recite and he would say, "In my," he would say, "I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also. In my father's house there are many rooms to live in. I'm going to prepare a place." Um, that's what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 2. If you look in the Greek, if you look in the Aramaic, if you look in any translation, the word mansion is not there. Historically, I learned in Bible school back in 1979, historically, the translators of the King James English version did not want King James to feel ripped off <laughs> that he, being the king of England, would live in a regular house when he went to heaven. So they inserted the word mansion. And the rest, as they say, is history. So what it doesn't make sense grammatically even. In my father's house, there are mansions. You know, how do you put mansions in my father's house? You know, you, you, we would never use that grammatically. But what he did say, it's the same word for abode or places to live. It's, it's used, the exact same word is used in John 14, 23, just, just 20 verses later, uh, 21 verses later. So he said, in my father's house, there are many places to live. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And in heaven, there it, it's a court. In fact, let me, you mentioned tree houses, so I'm going to mention, I'll mention that. So anyway, when we first landed, there were one of the things I noticed were a group of people, men and women together, coming out of the woods, out of the forest to my left. And there were all kinds of houses to my right from all ages, all centuries, different kinds to my right. So to have them coming from the forest was kind of a surprise. I said, where did you come from? And they, and I said, where do you live? And they said, we live in tree houses. And, um, and they said, this is what we're comfortable with. So that's what we have uh, for now here in heaven. And so that was my first clue about a person feeling comfortable. Later, later after this experience, I went and I started doing research and found out that there are some tribes or a tribe somewhere in like New Guinea, if I recall, that builds tree houses, build houses up in the trees. Uh, tribal people. And so then my curiosity was like, okay, how did you come to the Lord, you know, et cetera. But at that time, I didn't know any of that. They just said they lived in tree houses. Well, um, I'll give you two examples, Jennifer. I'll give you two. One I shared yesterday or earlier when we talked. And um, the first example was really from, um, I saw two men walking along part of the river um, and they were talking about things. And um, I asked my angel, I said, so what are they talking about? And my angel said, and they're walking away from me, you know, but, but it's like, they're clearly talking. I was just curious. And there were a bunch of houses, like rectangular ranch style houses, all kind of cluster in a circle down a, a little ways away. And I asked my angel, I said, so what are they talking about? And he said, it's none of your business. He said, but I can tell you it has to do with when he Le had a big fight with his dad when he was 17 years old and he left the house. And so when they, they were talking, I said, so I, I knew that somehow that they lived on a ranch. I said, where, where are they walking? Where are they walking to? And he said, that was their family ranch. And I said, what about the houses that those little rectangular houses all around? He said, that's where the rest of the relatives and family live. And I just thought that's, that just blew my mind that, that, you know, they lived on a ranch in, in real life, uh, you know, on the earth, and but they never had a, a situation. But here's a, a little cluster of homes where relatives were together. So that was interesting. 
But one of the most telling was we came walking by and there was this uh, kind of a Victorian style American right out of a catalog house with a wraparound front porch. But it was small. It wasn't like a big sprawling Victorian mansion. This was just a little small, maybe maybe a couple bedrooms upstairs type of size with a wraparound porch, one front door and one window, you know, looking out through the porch and then a covered porch and then a small upstairs, relatively small house, but it was still had that wraparound porch and all that. And there's a, a dirt path, like, like uh, some grass and like you might make with wagon wheels almost or tires going back. And there's a, like a mud hut um, that I had only seen in like National Geographic of and, and from missionary friends and some of our affiliates in different parts of Africa, like in Kenya and Uganda and such, um, that it was like a, basically a mud hut, kind of a reddish mud to it. Uh, and anyway, so I walk back there and this woman comes out and I, you know, just said, I, I was just curious, I'm sorry, you've got this house out front and then you've got this hut back here. And she said, she said, yes, yeah, she said, I lived in Kenya. And this is my this is my home. This is what I was comfortable with and where I lived on earth. But I had seen pictures of those American homes with the wraparound porch and it looks so neat and and tidy. And she said, I always wanted in my heart. I always wanted something like that. I always wanted that house. So when I came to heaven, the, the father was gracious enough to me to give me that. But, and she said, and I go there and I spend time there, and I, but I sit on the porch and talk to people as they walk by and, and I spend time there. But she said, I'm, I'm more comfortable in the home that I grew up in. And I just thought, again, it was like, oh, the father is so good. He's just so kind. You know, just there's such a feeling of, of comfort there um, and peace and grace and, and answers to your heart's desire. That's you know, right. people will say, oh, when I get to have, I'm going to have a mansion, and it's going to have 14 rooms and, and everything. It's like, you know what, the things of the earth drop off, the things that you think you would ask the Lord uh, here, it's like, oh, if I ever see Jesus, I'm going to ask him this. No, that's of the flesh. None of that gets through. None of that, that even matters. The only the things of the spirit matter, the things of the heart are what the father moves on, because he is a spirit and he addresses us Amen. in our spirit. And so that's the that's the nature of things uh in heaven so wow. it's amazing and that's biblical <laughs> god says so give you the all the desires of your heart so if you don't get it on earth you're going to get it in heaven the good desires and those desires are in line with him that's right you know that's yeah. what's special about them exactly exactly so so do you know if, if you saw any house that looked like a mansion there or or were they all just different? Because I know you saw row houses like in Philadelphia, how they have it there. So you saw different. Did you see any big houses or not when you were there? Yeah, there were yeah, there were big houses like you might see in an American neighborhood or or a European neighborhood, you know, nowadays. Uh, there were houses individual with larger yards and stuff like that. There was just all kinds, all mm. kinds. It's it's the thing that struck me, honestly, was that how how heaven is really just a city. You know, and I know that I know that we talk about the heavenly Jerusalem, and it's a city. Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a city, and we talk about the city of Zion. And you can read in the Book of Revelation where heaven, uh, you know, prepared as a bride for her husband, descends down into the earth. And though you know those things mentally, but when you actually see it, you come away and say, you know what? This is just a big city, and life goes on. It's got a huge rural area, huge you know, just a huge area. And, uh, you know, we talked about earlier about how heaven is larger on the inside than it is on the outside, which Jesus explained the kingdom of heaven is like a seed. And the question I always ask people is, if you have one apple seed, how many apple trees are in that single seed? And in that single tree, how many apples are in the, on that tree? And how many apple seeds are in those apples? So a, a single apple seed is larger on the inside than it is on the outside. And that's how human beings are. I have, I'm 64 years old. I have gifts. I have talents. I have hobbies. I have things that I'd like to do and explore. You know, I can tell you all about myself and things that I'd like with woodworking. And I, I like the study of gems and I'd like to have a, a wood shop and a workshop. I'd like to make boats and furniture and love to do all these kinds of things. I, I don't have the time, the age, the money, the energy. 
but I'm already in eternity. And that's the thing that, that I came away with is that if something in my heart doesn't come to pass now in this life, maybe 200 years from now in the millennial age, 500 years from now, 600 years from now, I don't know what good things the father has for me, but I know that it's good. I know that he's going to continue to show forth the riches of his kindness towards us in Christ. And so I have a much, much greater patience, a much bigger, big picture look at things that life really does just go on. Um, you know, Jennifer, something that, that I tell people, especially when I deal with agnostics or atheists or, or people like this, and I first heard it from the lips of my wife's grandmother um, when Barb and I were first married and, and everything, and we her she her grandmother was a was a Christian and towards the end of her life she was in a wheelchair about 89 90 years old in a wheelchair in a nursing home and she she chuckled one day and she said you know she said in time it, she said inside i still feel like that 17 year old girl who could run through the orchard, the orchard at at our farm she said but my body's changed around me and that I mean, I was just a young man. Barbara and I were married when we were 19 and 20. And I remember that stuck with me, that the proof that we are eternal beings is that inside we still feel the same as we did when we were a teenager or a young person, but our bodies have changed around us. That proves that you don't need your body to live because you're inside in your spirit, in your soul, it has gone on unchanged. It has not been affected by the years, by the decades even. Inside, you still feel like you could, you know, in my case, I still feel like I could dunk a basketball, you know, but I, but my body's changed. I'm not in the shape for it. Um, and it's like her grandmother, you know, nearly 90 years old saying, I was inside, I still feel like that 17-year-old girl who could run through the orchard. She said, but my body's changed around me. That lines up with what I saw in heaven, which is, of course, our Lord is like in his mid-30s, early to mid-30s, and people look like that, except that if they died when they were older, their years of experience, even in the world, but their years of experience, the wisdom that they now have in retrospect, looking at it through the Lord's eyes, and any time that they had in the Lord, somehow that is reflected in their eyes and on their face, and you know that they're an old person but physically they still look young and there's nothing on earth to compare it to that I could say, except that the effects of gravity and time disappear because it's just your spirit and soul right now in body, your spirit and soul. So you, you reach that point of agelessness of maturity, and then you stay there, but somehow your life experiences is somehow written on your countenance. And it's pretty amazing actually. Wow. But there's nothing to compare it to. Oh, yeah, I'm, I so can never fathom it. Yeah, I always try to fathom when everyone says that, but I just can't. Is there anything else you saw in heaven? Uh, That's pretty neat. <laughs> oh, the stuff that I'm willing to, to share and, yes. and talk about. To me, the most precious one is around the Father's throne. You know, like I described earlier, the Father and I, um, I've known the Father since I was, you know, 16, 17 years old, really talking to him and and, and getting to know him. So you can read in John chapter one, where it says, no man has seen the father, but the son who's in the bosom of the father has revealed him. That's like John 1, 18, maybe 16, 17, 18. And then Jesus said in John chapter six, you know, somewhere verse 45, 46, something like that, that nobody has seen the father, but the son has seen him. The context of those statements is in the flesh. And the reason we know that you cannot see the Father in the flesh is your earth body could not handle his glory, his power. Uh, your earth body would be dissolved. And it's in that context, in those two verses in the Gospel of John, that Jesus is speaking about, or that the Apostle John is speaking about. And the reason we know that is because the Father God is seen at least four times in Scripture. Uh, the biggest one that people really know about is the Re in, in the Revelation chapter 4 where the apostle John is caught up into heaven and he sees the throne of the father God. And he describes him and he describes the rainbow around about the throne. He describes a clear flooring before the throne. He describes the cherubs around singing, holy, holy, holy. And that's all of revelation chapter four. And we know it's the father because in chapter five, the apostle John starts crying because there's a bunch of scrolls that the father a scroll that the father has in his hand and nobody's worthy to open it. And, and they tell him, said, no, 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 the lion of the tribe of Judah, 
the Lamb of God who was slain but is now alive, he has been, been found worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals thereof. And then Revelation 5 and about verse 7 says that he, that is the Lamb, came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. So we know that Jesus received his kingdom from the Father. That's Revelation 1.1 says, this is the revelation that the Father gave, that God gave his son Jesus to show to the saints. Um, the second example is Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. And Daniel sees almost the same scene. He sees one that he calls the Ancient of Days. And he said, the Ancient of Days did sit, and the book, books were opened, and all the multitudes were brought before him. And then there came the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days, and the Ancient of Days gave him a kingdom, gave the Son of Man a kingdom that will have no end. So again, the Ancient of Days is the Father, and Daniel sees him. Uh, Moses talked to the Lord face to face, we are told. And only that time that he was in the flesh that the Lord said, okay, okay, you're not in spirit now, you're in the flesh, so you better get behind this rock, you know, and then I'll, then I'll show you. Um, Ezekiel chapter one, Ezekiel sees him too. He sees the throne coming to to uh, near him and he sees the father and he describes uh, the clear flooring under the under the, the throne he describes uh, the same cherubs around he describes the rainbow around same scene in revelation 4 so the father is seen uh, four times five times uh, and so people have it wrong if they say oh you know i went to heaven but i couldn't see the father's face well yeah you can if you're in the spirit uh, in the flesh you die so um have you seen the father's anyway. face oh yeah yeah um but when you're in the spirit again it's like there's only so much in the natural that you can actually continue in you, you know when peter was in the spirit and he saw on the mount of transfiguration in luke chapter 9 he saw moses and elijah appear to jesus and talk to jesus out of the law and the prophets about his death that would happen in jerusalem and peter what does peter do Hey, let's build some tents, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for you, Jesus. And we'll just have a little camp meeting right here, you know, because it all seems so normal and so natural. So my heart is always to worship the Father. So I just suddenly found myself on my knees to the side. As if the Father is looking straight ahead, I was on his left, on his left side. And, and this is rare because I really don't share this. Uh, this first time I was with the father, but it's, it's special, but I just, I feel I can, I could share it anyway. So I, I'm, my hands are down. The, the flooring is like it says, it's kind of, it's clear, but it's white. It's pure light and it's got a beveled edge. The tiles are, are really well fit, fit together, but kind of beveled, but not like you trip on it or catch a heel or something. There's just a, 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 a roundness you know, to the edges slightly. And, um, and the father's there, so he's, it's not, you don't think of him as 50 feet tall or 100 feet tall or, or something like that. I suppose if you were a child, he might, you might think he's 30 feet tall because the throne goes up a little bit. It's not like it's sitting like a recliner on your living room. There's, there's steps up to it and everything. And there's cherubs around there. Now, I'd seen cherubs before in another uh, experience, uh, visitation. They're about five and a half feet tall. Um, they're not very big. They're multiple winged, like it's described. Um, it was interesting that I was worshiping and I'll tell you, I'll share this with you and it may sound goofy, but I'm telling you, this is what, this is what happened. So I'm worshiping and the father looks at me, he turns and he looks at me and he says, I'll be back. And just then the cherubs, the two on my side start beating their wings. And there is this iridescent dust. Uh, that's the glory cloud. If, imagine if you're in a fog and every single piece of fog is a different color. Okay. Just imagine if you could see the mist and they start beating and start going, whoo, 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 and it sounds like a helicopter almost coming to you, just whoo, 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 whoo. And there was a point that they started beating their wings so fast and sound like that helicopter coming at you. And suddenly those, those, all those little iridescent particles of glory, just suddenly burst into flame and they were a complete ball of flame, completely enclosed in flames. And, and I could see through that they bent down and somehow they lifted up the flooring where the father was seated and they picked up the flooring and they put it like on their shoulders. And then the whole, and they did this in unison so that the, the throne platform is now on the cherub's shoulders. And then it picks up like this and the father says, I'll be back. And he goes like that and banks away like an airplane. 
and I'm going in my mind, I'm going, okay, chapter, verse, chapter, verse, chapter, verse, <laughs> you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm going back to Ezekiel chapter one, where Ezekiel is standing by the river Kibar, and he sees what he describes as balls of fire coming at him. And it's, he's describing the throne platform of, of the Father God. And, and in, then in my mind, I'm remembering that, that the Lord, the Father, is an oriental king. And oriental kings, if, you, if you've ever seen a Chinese tapestry, if you've ever seen uh, Indi, Indian um, subcontinent of India, if you've ever seen anything from India, they hold their potentates, they hold their officials, their kings, their emperors on their shoulders on a, on a dais there that there's a seat and everything. And I remembered how the Levites were instructed to run a pole through the Ark of the Covenant and carry it on their shoulders for the Holy of Holies. And so all this is going through, it's like, wow, this makes sense. I just never thought this is how it would be applied. And it seemed like a half an hour went by, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, so the Father God does go places in the universe. He can go places. He can't. He visited Ezekiel. He came down on Mount Sinai. You know, in Revelation 4, he brought John up to him. You know, and I'm going through all of this. Uh, the Father came down on the Mount of Transfiguration. He came down to the top of the mountain to talk to Jesus and Moses and Elijah. Yeah, so he came, the, the whole process was reversed. And he came, it seemed like a half an hour. He, he came down, they, he came in, sat down, the cherubs, you know, took off the shoulder, put the flooring back so it was a seamless transition. And they stood there and their wings just slowed down just like that. And uh, anyway. That's, John, so, that just blew my mind. Blew my mind. That's so like visual, visually, beautifully glorious. I've never heard anything like that before. Wow. Well, it's, it's you know, that's why other than telling my wife, I really didn't say much for years and years. That's a, No, it's a um, blessing. I, I feel like, still, yeah. But <laughs> I've been before the father many times before, many times since. You and know. you didn't have to die to get to heaven, right? <laughs> well, like I, I shared earlier, I said the first time it happened, I was like, Father, I want to make sure this is a round trip. <laughs> uh, no, this was a this was a visitation. It seemed it seemed like in my mind it took hours and hours, but on earth time, I think it was something like 40 minutes. But it seemed like hours and hours. I had all the time in the world. Um you know, it's, it's really the way time is, um, there's stuff I could share with you that I can't share chat that I could, can't prove chapter and verse, but I don't know if anybody would be interested in listening to it anyway. Um, but I can just say that, that heaven's real. It's a big city and, um, and relatives and friends and people who knew you as a baby, but you never knew, uh, who gone on. Um, it, it's just amazing that life can, goes on and it's very, very normal. Mm -hmm. It's very, very normal. You're not all just, just hanging around playing harps or something like that. You're, there's a lot of talking going on, a lot of just visiting and people telling their stories and, and uh, probably like the gospel of John that, you know, all the books of the world couldn't contain uh, the full content of what the Lord has done. And there's a lot of sharing like that and just having fun, just there was there was there was a lady who I knew on Earth uh, had been afraid of birds and and and, and when, when I saw her she was sitting there holding a bird uh, on her. This was a separate this was a separate uh, uh, separate visitation or whatever. But she was holding a bird and looking at a bird. And on Earth she was afraid of birds. Uh, so it was like it was very interesting butterflies and birds and. And animals very normal, and and if you think about it again, that heaven comes down to earth at the end of the revelation, it only makes sense that all of that is still there. That's right, that's right. So heaven is like earth, right? Heaven looks like earth, but it's one hundred one hundred times better, right? Or a million times better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It's very comfortable. Very, everything is the same, and yet everything is different. Wow. But, but it's it's very comfortable, mm -hmm. at ease completely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a sky? Do you see a sky? I know there's no sun, but is there a sky in heaven? Do you see clouds and blue? Uh, you know, what I saw was just uh, blues and pastels mm -hmm. um, in the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, I could tell by the intensity of the light where the throne was because it was pure white light. Um, so I would imagine the, the 
rough facsimile on earth would be like a setting sun or a rising sun except this was pure white light off in the distance where the, the sky was was pure white but the rest of the sky is blue and and pinks and just different pastels and everything really pretty now, um, what about food a lot of people wonder i like food i want to eat food i want the best of the food is there food in heaven and if so can i eat it um you know the largest part of that question i don't have an answer for i can say that there's fruit and that when you eat that fruit um not that i ate it but that i could see you know what people were doing um that there is like revelation you know on earth not everything of your food is absorbed into your body not part of it is waste you know it goes down the toilet but in heaven there's no waste so every bit of it is absorbed and becomes a a nutrient but it also has some sort of a a presence where i know that there is i want to say revelation or a depth a greater depth of understanding and appreciation of the lord it's not that everything is like super ultra spiritual it's just that everything in heaven can't help but reflect the things of god so when people eat like a fruit it's like absorbed into their system without any waste and and there's an element of revelation or depth of understanding a, a nuance if you will kind of nuance of what you already know but a depth that goes in so it's it's pretty interesting yeah and there will be food because the marriage supper of the lamb is all about food but i don't know what exactly that's going to entail so yeah yeah good answer so question for you so a lot of people who watch this channel you have believers and you have unbelievers um they're wondering does only good people go to heaven is only christian people go to heaven answer this i already know this answer a lot of people do but a lot of people do not know that people who are in heaven do you have to be a believer in jesus christ to get there <laughs> good question and i'm going to the the standard answer and i'll give you some real life examples okay i already told you about the boy in india who did not know the name of the creator and because of his ignorance all he knew was i want to know the creator. I want to know who made that field and those trees or those grasses and, and flowers. And he found out his name is Jesus. Similar experience with the Choco Indians of Panama. Some very good friends of ours became missionaries uh, in Panama to the Choco Indians. The Choco live between where, where Panama and the Darien jungle and the nation of Colombia all meet. And it's a dangerous, it's the most thickest part of the jungle in the world. Um, in fact, you may not realize this, but there's a highway called the Pan American Highway. And it goes from Alaska down to the tip of South America. And you can actually travel. If you want to get in Alaska, or you want to get to South America, and you want to travel one way or the other, you can actually travel the length of the Americas on the Pan Am Highway. But there's one area that they never completed because it's too thick, too, too treacherous. And that is the Darien jungle where the Chocos live. And the and after our friends had been down there a couple of years, and many of the people of the many of the Chocos uh, had readily accepted the Lord. At that time, they thought there would be about seventy thousand total population down there, and many of the villages just as a whole village just believed on the Lord Jesus. And some time later, uh, our friends said, "You know, why do you believe so easily? It didn't take hardly anything to to, to convince you about Jesus." And they said they told him this. They said. When we became a people, and anthropologists believe that they became a people around the year 900. So it was, you know, after Jesus, 900 years after Jesus, but uh, about five or 600 years before the uh, conquistadors arrived. So in the year 900, he, uh, he said, when we became a people, a being in white appeared to our forefathers. And he said, worship the creator the God who, who gives you all the jungle and all the plants and the animals for your use and love one another. That's what's required of you. And then disappeared. And so the Choco, you know, fathers said, you know, here we are these last, you know, what is to us, you know, 600 years or whatever the case is, or, or 1100 years, excuse me. 
11, 1200 years. He said, we've been doing that. He said, we did, we've been worshiping the creator of the jungle, but we didn't know his name until you came. And so when we learned his name, it was very easy for us to, to believe uh, in his name. And then he confirmed it with signs and wonders. And, you know, they, they had all, they still to this day have all sorts of miracles. So what you have to do, certainly Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to get to know the Father, you have to believe in Jesus. But I want to take it a step further. Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, to know you, my Father, and your Son, whom you've, whom you've sent. It's not just believing. Believing on the Lord Jesus is not a philosophy. It is not like, I believe in Buddha, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Krishna. It's not like that at all. To Once you make that choice and say, I'm going to take this step of faith and believe. God's working on my heart. I've got to do something with my soul. Why am I here on this earth? He's right. I feel the same on the inside as I did when I, you know, 30 years ago or when I was a kid. And so it's not just believing, it is knowing. When you, when you make that decision, when you recognize that, hey, you're, he's right, you know, I'm, I'm the same on the inside as I was as when I was a kid or a teenager, but my body's changed around me. I don't have the same abilities that I used to physically, but inside I'm still the same person. Once you recognize that and you say, Jesus, take charge of my life. I, I, I want to know my purpose in life. I want to know why I'm here on the planet. Then it's not just believing, but it's knowing. And that's what, what Jesus said. To know you, Father, and his and uh, your, your son whom you've sent. So it's believing and knowing, and they are inseparable. So it's not like a philosophy. It is to believe and know. And it's very simple. You know, all I did was just say, Lord, it makes sense to serve you now because you're going to have the final word, the last say in my life. So I give you my life. It was that simple. Mm -hmm. The boy in India, all he did was, I want to know the creator. I don't know who it is, who his name is, but I want to know him. Uh, the Choco Indians, it's the same way. I, I know he's the creator. And there, there are probably people out there who said, I've always believed God is the creator in the larger sense of the world, uh, in the world's beauty and and all of that. I don't understand how there could be evil. I don't understand why he doesn't step in. I don't understand why he allows bad things to happen. Uh, but I still believe in God in the general sense. Um, that is the next step is to say, I give you my life. I don't understand everything, but I give you my life. And that believing in, in Jesus and that getting to know the Father. Um, you know, if, if I could, Jennifer, what people go through the New Testament calls illuminating or the eyes of their understanding being opened. Um, in, in, in Hebrews 6, 4, it says that you first have to become enlightened and then you taste the heavenly gift. You can't just decide, okay, I'm going to accept Jesus. There is an enlightenment. There is a, a tug on the heart. In, in John chapter 6, uh, verses 44 and through 46, Jesus is talking and he says, no, he, he says, first, as it is written, all men will be taught of God. Therefore, those who have learned of God come to me. And so what Jesus is saying is there is a, a drawing process that a person feels in their heart that's like, I've got to do something with my life. I've got to find answers. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Who can help me out of this mess? And, and that is the drawing. That is the eyes being open, enlightenment, that you say, I need something larger than myself. I need someone larger than myself. And then you take that step of faith and say, Jesus, take control of my life. Father God, take control of my life. And then you just, it all just changes. Because he's real. It's not just not just a philosophy. It, it is actually knowing that you can know God. To me, this is the greatest adventure anybody could have, to know God. Are you kidding me? Somebody says, hey, I know God, and I can help you to know him too. That's the greatest adventure in life, to know God. He's unfathomable. He's, he's sovereign. If he was predictable, he wouldn't be God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of that, you mentioned to me that, or you explained the feeling of the presence be between the difference of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and angels. So there's different sure. feelings where you can know who's who. Could you share that? Real right. Quick? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, the Father, the Father, the, the Trinity, if you will, spirit, soul, and body. We are a Trinity, spirit, soul, and body. 
um, in our spirit man, that is the deepest part of us where we wonder, why am I here? What is my purpose? That's when you lay in your bed at night and you look down on the inside of you and you say, I feel so empty. I don't have direction. I don't have purpose. And you contemplate things down deepest in, in you. That's your spirit. And your soul is where you think and feel. Okay. When you're thinking on those things, you're, you're usually kind of still, you're looking at your deeper innermost parts. So the presence of the father is very much like that. He is a spirit. And so he deals with us down there where our spirit man is. He is the father of spirits. We're told in Hebrews 12, nine, he created our spirit. So he is the one who created us, who gifted us, who purposed things in our lives. So the presence of the father and the way I could explain it to people who have been in a worship service um, is like a holy hush. The presence of the father who deals with the inner core reasons of why we're here, the direction of our life, our purpose in life, um, why he created us, deep, deep, deep things that his presence feels like a holy hush. It's the it's where you're sitting there in the worship and nobody says a thing. It's where your feet feel like you're, you've got shoes of cement, of concrete, where you, you just feel like you would be violating something sacred if you spoke, if you got up and moved, if you said anything or did anything, you feel like you'd be violating the thickness of the atmosphere. It's a very holy, very quiet, very hush-hush type of, you just sit there in, in silence. And that's the Father's presence. He deals with people way down on the inside. Jesus, however, is like the soul. Jesus deals with our thoughts, our emotions. He became a man so he could experience what we experience. The Father God's a spirit. He's never, he's never slept. He doesn't know what it's like to have to use the bathroom. He's never gotten tired. He's never gotten hungry. But Jesus left that to become a man so that he could experience these things. So when the presence of the Lord Jesus is very much like um, uh, in the soulish realm, in our fears, in our worries, in our concerns, in our joys, in our laughter, in our sadness. He's very in the, in the emotional realm. And that's why you find the presence of the Lord is more like to touch someone's mind and their memories and their hurts, or maybe physically something that they, they need healing on. And that's the presence of Jesus. Um, the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is the bridge, the communicator. Uh, John 16, 13, Jesus had just told the disciples in verse 12, I've got lots more to say to you, but you can't grasp it right now. But And then in verse 13, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will uh, not speak of himself. He'll guide you into all truth because he will not speak of himself, but whatever he hears, that's what he will speak, and he'll show you things to come. And so the Holy Spirit's methods of communicating from the Lord Jesus and from the Father is guide, speak, and show, but only, only speak is verbal. The rest of them are, are visual or, or perceptions, witness, discerning, something like that. So the presence of the Holy Spirit is when he speaks, it's on the inside, and it's loud. It is very specific. The Father can communicate things like you discern something, you pick up on something, you perceive something. I feel right about this. This bears witness with me. Uh, I feel an urge to pick up the phone, a friend you know, it crosses my mind. I wonder what they're doing. I think I'll contact them and find out that they have a prayer request. But the Holy Spirit, when he speaks, it is clear, it is concise. In Acts chapter 8, um, the Holy Spirit said to Philip, join yourself to that chariot. Um, the angel said something specific to him too earlier, take the road that goes down to the desert through Gaza and, and take that road. Um, but angels are from the outside because they're individuals. The Holy Spirit is on the inside. Uh, the Holy Spirit um, talked to Peter in Acts chapter 10. And he was up on the rooftop and he was in a trance and he saw this vision. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, there are three men below who are looking for you. Go with them, nothing doubting, because I've sent them. And there were three Gentiles, three Romans. So he wouldn't normally have gone with them. But the Holy Spirit gave very specific directions. My experience has been when people say, I heard God audibly, or I heard his voice 99 times out of 100. Once I interview him in detail and kind of interrogate what actually was going on, 99 times out of 100, they have heard the Holy Spirit for the very first time in their lives. It was not audible except to them. It was, it was it, because they're not used to God just speaking loudly, clearly, and it does sound like a loudspeaker in the brain, <laughs> uh, you know, 
And so people was like, okay, did everybody hear that? Uh, that's how it sounds audibly. I heard God audibly. What they're really hearing, if you look at the book of Acts, they're just hearing the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens to me when I give a prophetic word. It's like in Acts 21, 21, where Agabus, the prophet, grabs Paul's belt and he says, this is what the Holy Spirit says. The man who owns this belt will be uh, arrested by the Jews and turned over to the Romans. And that means Agabus heard the Holy Spirit himself um, via the Father, the Son, but communicating directly what they said. And that's that happens pretty often with me now. It didn't used to, but it does. It has now for a long time. But there, so there is the distinction. The Father's presence feels very heavy. Uh, like you don't want to move. You don't want to speak. You don't feel like you, sh like you could even sometimes you just feel like very heavy, like your feet are very heavy. You can't move. Jesus deals with the soulish realm, the physical realm, and deals with our emotions, our hurts, our thoughts, our anguish, our joys, our worries. And then the Holy Spirit, when he gives direction, he's not speaking of himself, but whatever he hears, that's what he speaks, according to John 16, 13. Um, and this is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 as well, verses 9 through 16. He said that I, ear, and imagination cannot know the things that God's prepared for those that love him, but he has revealed these things to us by his spirit, for the spirit searches the deep things of the Father God. And so the Holy Spirit is there searching right now, what has the Father got for us? So when he hears something from the Father, he communicates it to us. So when a person says, I've heard the Holy Spirit, that's a direct word, direct from the Father. And so when they speak to you, the Father is... I don't, to me, he sounds like a dad, like an authoritative, not, not like over, you know, anxious, whatever, but he's just, he's just the boss, you know, he's heavy. Whereas Jesus is, like I said, more in the solar realm. It's hard to explain, but. Uh, so how about the difference weird. with angels? So how would okay, you know well, it's not an angel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, an angel, that's interesting. If you look at the book of Acts uh, and you look at the Old Testament as well, Angels are always on the outside because they're individuals. They feel like a person anointed by the Spirit, just like a human being. They feel like a person, they have the presence of the Holy Spirit the same way a Christian might have. If you were alone in a room and suddenly you feel like somebody else is there and it's not real, real strong, like it's, you know, the Lord himself, but you feel like the presence of the Lord, but like it's a person. And usually they're, you know, if they're going to talk to you, they're within four or five feet and it comes across uh, what they say, if you perceive it in your spirit, sometimes it's almost like a suggestion. It's it's usually um, just a sentence or two that's specific. And um, like I said, it can be like a suggestion almost. It's like, um, uh, you know, I shared earlier with you when I was 14 years old, I had a mini bike. And my mom's rule was you always wear a helmet, John, if you're going to ride that mini bike. Well, um, I, a kid wanted to race me. He is, his go-kart said he could go as fast as my mini bike could, about 40 miles an hour. And I heard behind me, I was debating, I was holding my helmet, I was debating. I'm a 14-year-old I'm kid, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I've got a little bit of pride there. I'm a teenage boy. Should I wear my helmet or not? I look stupid in this helmet. It was an old football helmet that I painted gold to match the paint on the mini bike, you know? And I heard this voice behind me say, go ahead and obey your mom and put on your helmet. And I heard that. I knew at the time it was out from the outside. I perceived it, but I never really processed it. And as soon as I heard it, I took it almost like my own suggestion and said, you know what? I think I'll go ahead and obey my mom and put on my helmet, put on the helmet. Went over to his house, raced. He ran into me, had a wreck, had a concussion, three days in the hospital, another five days recovering at home. That helmet saved my life. But it was that voice of that, that voice that was almost like a suggestion, a very gentle, go ahead and obey your mom and put on your helmet. That's oftentimes how an angel is. It's, 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 it's like, a, I'm convinced, having talked to different people down through the years, I'm convinced that a lot of people find their missing car keys, their sunglasses, and things of that nature. They receive reminders. Uh, you know, I left home and you have this nagging feeling, I forgot something, what did I forget? And then they hear a voice, it just comes up out of them. You know, you forgot to take the receipt to, to get your money back. Or, you know, you're saying, okay, Father, where in the world did I put my glasses? And suddenly there's this, this suggestion, it's like, look over in your, go look in the closet. You know, you were, you were there with the, your hands in the, 
you know, holding your keys when you got that out of the closet and you inadvertently left them on the shelf in the closet and then shut the door. You, people have experiences like that all the time. They don't always realize they're saying, okay, is that an angel? Is that the Lord? What is that? But when it comes from the outside and it almost seems like a suggestion that floats, floats somehow into your, your mind of like a suggestion of, I think I'll do this. And uh, that's an angel. That's usually an angel. Oh, that's good. That's <laughs> good. So John, you know, so much about so much, but not for any reason. Well, you're a pastor. You've been a pastor for many years. And you say you used to pastor churches all around America, but you changed the way you pastor in a way. Could you tell us about that in your ministry? Sure. Well, our website, cwowi.org, I think is on your uh, page as well. Church Without Walls International. I was in various capacities in ministry for 25 years. Um, actually, I started ministering to my peers as a 16, 17, 18 year old. And I was in that, what I would call the auditorium, the traditional church for 25 years. Um, I, was, I was even an elder in a, in a mega church, a leader in a mega church, a head of a Bible school. And by mega church, I think at that time there were like 13,000 members. Uh, you know, Easter service through six services might have 24,000 people. I mean, it was a, a big church with a big production on Easter and Christmas, you know, the whole bit. Um, but I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly of doing what I would call professional Christianity. And there are different, you know, Jennifer, there are different things that happen in your life that are like little check marks where God gets your attention. One of those was a, a former student of mine. She had been in one of my Bible school classes, which means that she was surrounded by, you know, 150 or 200 kids or something, or adults, excuse me. And she was a part of the church choir, which meant there were 200 people in that. And she went to practice for, the, for every Thursday night. And she was a single woman in her early 40s. And one day I learned that she had gone out to one of the lakes on the west side of Tulsa here, uh, Lake West on the west side of Tulsa, and at sundown put a gun to her head and killed herself. And I thought there's over 10,000 people in this church. There's a couple hundred people in the choir. She sat in a Bible school class with 150, 175, 200 people, whatever. How is it nobody knew her? How is it we did not know her and she didn't know anybody to reach out to help her before she committed suicide? That's one of those little, okay, Mark. So I began, I began asking the Lord, asking the Father, you know, how to do church, um, how, you know, how, how, you know, I began, I began, I left that position. I began traveling around North America, talking to some, you know, big names and, and stuff like that. And the questions were always the same. How do I grow my church? How do I pay for my church? How do I keep people from leaving my church? And it's like, they were all advertising were different, but in reality, they were the same. And we were becoming increasingly irrelevant to our culture. So I, I had some students who had been to Indonesia and different places like that, and they talked about house church. So I was searching the Father. I'd been down to Brownsville. I'd gotten to know uh, them down there a little bit. And I was seeking the Father saying, where are you moving next? So Jan in February 4th of 2001, I was in Mississauga, Ontario, and the Lord appeared to me during the worship service. My eyes were wide open. I saw the worship team. I was worshiping. But suddenly the Lord was there and he came walking over and he said this, he said, see what I see, people running to and fro to this meeting and that, looking for the spectacular, thinking that is supernatural, while they miss the supernatural work in their midst, even in their own hearts, for the process of discipleship is supernatural. And then he said a few more things, then he said this, as it was in the beginning, so it must be now, I'm moving in relationships. That was February 4th of 2001. So for the next few months, I, I, I realized, Jennifer, something that, that I had to repent of, that I was horrified with, and that is this. I saw that the whole of the New Testament from Matthew through the Revelation was written by apostles doing church in the house. And they were writing to people who were doing church in the house. And I repented. I was horrified that for 25 years, I had pulled the New Testament out of the context and tried to put it in an auditorium and make it work. And no wonder there are so many books in the bookstores and everything else about how to do church, because, because the whole 1,700 years of Christianity was all about pulling it out of the home and trying to squeeze it and make it work in the auditorium. And it, the fivefold, the gifts of the Spirit, 
um, everything, the Lord's Supper, everything, it was all designed to be in the home. So once I realized that, and then I started, I started researching the body of Christ in China, in India, in places around the world, and I saw um, U.S. Center for World Missions, um, you know, said that Christianity is the fastest growing church uh, religion in the world, 7.7 or 7.8 percent, and it's all in house church. And uh, I heard a Chinese house church leader say that a million Chinese come to the Lord every single month, and they all go right into home-based churches. And I started realizing that the house church, people didn't meet in houses in, in the book of Acts because of persecution. It was actually part of the synagogue system that had begun in about 160 BC when they developed a national education program uh, because they were losing the Jewishness of, of what it is to be Jewish. And so uh, they, they began meeting in homes on Saturdays on Sabbath, and they began rotating who leads and and everything, they would have 10 families as a, as a general minimum. They would rotate homes. They would take turns reading the scripture. Um, the ones who started it all, the Pharisees, copied the word, and they would go through, and they'd open the scrolls, and you could read from different passages. So when Pentecost happened, they just kept meeting in homes. And of course, the first home where the Lord met with people was Adam and Eve in the garden. Two or three are gathered in my name. I'm there in the midst. So God's never left the home. And I told Barb in October of 2001, I said, I don't want to pastor a church again, but if I did, it would be out of my, out of our living room, the way Paul did it. And then November 4th of 2001. So the first visitation was in February. This is November. And I'm in Edmonton, Alberta, Western Canada, Sunday night service. And the Lord again appears this time. He's got the power turned up. The pastor next to me falls on his face. Three guys, three Bible school students that we had with us later said, Jesus was there. We saw him. He walked right past us. For me, my strength weakened. I fell to my knees, which I do anyway when I see the Lord usually. Um, but it was just the power was turned up. And he said this. He said, you've learned much from the people I brought across your path the last few months and what you studied in the word. He said, and you've been doing the work of an apostle, but now I'm laying hands on you for this task. And he, and he, start, and he put his hands on me. And he said, I want you to start. He said, I, he said, you've been doing the work of an apostle. But now I'm laying hands on you as an apostle for this task. I want you to start a house church and a house church network. And I want you to structure it in such a way to facilitate the development of house churches around the world. And I said, Lord, why? Why would I do that? I mean, frankly, I was earning a good living. I was traveling all over North America, teaching in lots of different churches and venues and stuff, um, mixing with some of the bigger names, you know, that sort of a thing. Why would you want me to do that? And he said this, he said, it's against a time to come. Be a resource for them for it's needed, for it's against a time to come. So we started in January of 2002 in our house. My wife had the same, a similar revelation. The Lord actually told her a few months before that we were going to be doing house church. And now we're in 50, 60 nations of, we're not a denomination. We're not a top-down organization. We're just a bunch of people on the same spiritual page who want to do church the way Paul and the apostles did church. And that is informally. Often there's a meal involved. You take turns who hosts, who leads. Um, it's, it's very much a fellowship, community, family, and it works. Um, and it, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, the Lord still appears to me. I encourage people to sign up, go to our website and sign up for my weekly thoughts and my newsletter. My newsletter is where I generally put anything prophetic or recent visitations. In fact, I, I shared in today's, as we're recording this, today's newsletter, I share uh, a recent visitation I had with the Lord where he talked about some of the future events. And I put that in the e-newsletter and they're archived on our website. So you can find them there too, under the newsletter, but, but sign up. Uh, the teachings aren't all about house church, a lot of stuff like what I've experienced and what the Lord's taught me out of the word. So um, doing church in the home. Amen. So what's, what's your website and how else can people reach you? Yeah. The website is CWOWI. Dot org church without walls international so cwowi.org my book that of my journey from the auditorium to the house is is called return of the first church and they can get that online amazon return of the first church uh, you know for your folks like i i do a, every wednesday morning i do a, a youtube video about usually 10 to 7 to 15 minutes in length 7 to 13 minutes in, in length 
every Wednesday on YouTube. And you can sign up for that too. And you'll find on there that I've offered to email the PDF of my book, Return of the First Church, to anybody for free. I'm, I'm not, uh, um, I've been to heaven. I'm not, I've got to earn a living, but I'm not trying to get rich. Uh, you know, so be, I tell people, if you will email me at C-W-O-W-I at AOL.com, C-W-O-W-I at AOL.com, I will upload the PDF of my journey, Return of the First Church, to you. Or you can ask for Pursuing the Seasons of God, which is documented some of the early visitations like I described earlier. I'll send you that PDF as well. So I just want people to be blessed and to know the Father and to know the Lord. Um, I don't, it's just, it's just, He's just good. Well, John, I want to thank you so much for accepting this interview. You know, I've I've uh, interacted with you for what four years or so, and I just see the fruit of the spirit in you, and just the knowledge that you have of God and just the relationship. Um, and you're very reliable. I found. Um, I want to ask you if you could, could you please pray for people who want to know Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and to have that intimate relationship with Him like you've been experiencing. Yeah, I would just say this, that don't turn it into a religion. Turn, Make sure it's a relationship. I tell people that they want to know their heavenly father. You know, a lot of people can relate to Jesus and because he's so relatable. But the father, they think of an angry God with a baseball bat sitting up in the sky. And, and so when you read like John 14, 9, where Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father, the mind goes tilt because of Old Testament stuff that is really either improperly translated or you don't understand the context or, or you've been taught wrong. So get to know the Heavenly Father. Every prayer in the New Testament, every request prayer of the New Testament is to the Father. And I, I encourage you to talk to him conversationally. Uh, you don't have, even have to pray a prayer of say, okay, I've got to do this and then talk. Just start talking to the Father. And it'll sound funny. Trust me, I was there. <laughs> I was there. Yeah, I remember being alone in my bedroom as a teenager saying, okay, this sounds funny, but I'm going to talk to you. And I talked out loud. But you can talk just conversationally. Thank him for, for the little coincidences, the little bits of serendipity that happened during the day, the little, little happy things. It's like, wow, you got that parking spot. Or, oh, the light was green. I was able to go that way. Or, oh, wow, I just happened to run into my neighbor that I hadn't seen before. You turn that and you say, thank you, Father, for that. Thank you for ordering my steps. You turn into conversation. Thank you for a great morning. What a beautiful sunrise, pretty sunset. Talk to him conversationally. That's the way you get it going. So I, I want to just pray with you that, that you will have what I always pray is what Paul prayed for people. And so and so let me just pray that and you'll, you'll understand the gist of, of what Paul prayed for and my heart for you too, in that conversational relationship with the Father God and with the Lord Jesus. But Father God, I ask right now, according to what Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, 17 through 19, that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, that you would open the eyes of our understanding to know the invitation uh, that we have in you. And that in Ephesians 3, uh, 14 through 20, similarly, Father, that you would strengthen everyone listening and watching by your spirit in their inner man, so that they can know that which is beyond knowing. That is the height and the depth and the breadth and the length and the width, the full volume of the love of Christ. Do that in their spirit man. Open the eyes of their understanding. Cause just a re resonance. Even if the mind is going, I don't, I don't know what's going on, but you can feel a resonance. You can feel a witness on the inside. Let that witness from your spirit, Father, continue to grow in them. And, and draw them and pull them forth. Father, speak to them, show them things that they never had before. Father, let them know you've been there the whole time and show them areas of their lives, why they're alive now, even, even before, years and years before, where you saved their life, where you, where you caused things to, to not happen to them, uh, you know, where they were saved out of a precarious situation or there was a provision that just happened to, to happen, or maybe there was a, a voice that spoke to them not to do this or to do that. Or maybe they just had that leading, that premonition, that, that urge to do something, to know that you have been talking to them their whole lifetime, to bring them to this point of decision, to bring them to this point of just getting to know you for the first time in their life, to really make an effort. Not that they just knew you in a nebulous sort of way or as the creator, but now purposefully, conversationally, 
de deciding to say, I'm going to have a conversation with God. I'm going to talk to him. And then I'm going to list for, listen for the casual reply. I'm going to listen for the quiet, that, that still voice, that, the, the, the peaceful waters in my soul that he speaks back to me as a result. Maybe not audibly, maybe audibly, but certainly things I can perceive, things I can pick up with in my spirit. And so, Father God, I ask that you would do all that. And I thank you for doing it. I thank you for healing people emotionally and physically, Father God. Let them, let them know now, even as I'm praying, I can sense that there are conditions which are going to be gradually getting better. It's a slow healing, but it's a turning point right now as you're listening for this. It's a condition that's been chronic, and, and the Father God is just rearranging your system. He's resetting. I don't know what system it is, but it's being reset so that your body will recover itself from this chronic condition. And you'll find, uh, in hindsight, when you find that that's all gone, you're going to remember this time and say, oh, my Father God did that. So thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. John Finn of Church Without Walls International, thank you so much for this amazing, amazing interview. Hope we can do it again, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me.